I suppose I should have gone in for a few minutes, but I just couldn't do it. Burying someone from a family you've known from childhood, someone cut down in the prime of life, well, it's hard to take. I could say goodbye from here. Besides, I could do more good out on the road. I could keep trying to prevent other people from killing themselves in their cars and bringing to other families, like the Dixons in there, that heartbreak that never quite heals. It was hard to believe that just a few days before, the Dixon family had been as happy and contented a group of people as you'd find anywhere. Frank Jr. had just come home from college to give his dad a little help on the farm for the summer. He was a chip off the old block, studying scientific agriculture at school and getting ready to follow in his dad's footsteps. Frank's girl, Betty Hutchins, had been waiting for him, of course. Everyone knew they'd be getting married before too long. Mr. Dixon's new tractor had just arrived down at the Union Pacific freight station, and they all went down to inspect it. Frank's kid brother, Alan, had just taken his driving test a week before. Alan sure wanted to drive his dad's new tractor, but until he actually received the license, Dad Dixon wasn't letting him on the highway, not even on a tractor. The UP station agent had reminded Frank that the 411 Streamliner was due any minute. And of course, with Betty there, he wasn't taking chances anyway. If everyone was that careful all the time, well, a lot of people in the cemeteries would be alive today. It was the next Monday that Alan Dixon's first driver's license arrived in a noon mail delivery. Boy, was he proud of that license. He couldn't wait to show it to his brother. After all, your first license is sort of a milestone. It means all the roads are now open to you. He was proud of the license, naturally. And just as naturally, wanted to make use of it on any errand that his dad or his mother or his grandfather could think of. The only trouble was, I had to choose that moment to drive in and spoil things. Of course, when you've known a family as long as I'd known the Dixons, they don't treat you as a cop, but as a friend. Looks like you're gonna have another Dixon to worry about, huh? Oh, Alan, I got his driver's license. Oh, is that right? Well, let me see it, would you? You bet. Well, I guess that makes it official. When'd you get it? Just came today. Oh, just today, huh? Why'd I see you out driving on Highway 30 yesterday morning? This is my fault. I let him take the car to go and see his girl. I'm sorry I let him have it. I shouldn't have done it. Well, Alan shouldn't have asked for the car. No, he shouldn't have. Fine way to be starting your driving career. Violation already. I'm sorry. Well, it's only a technical violation. I didn't come here to arrest you, Alan. I knew you'd be getting that license any day now, and I thought this would be a good time to come by and tell you a few of the facts of life about driving before you get started. Now, these are accident reports from my headquarters. Each figure represents someone injured or killed in the state. On city streets, farm roads, highways, and railroad crossings. All the facts and figures are here. Well, some of them you've read about in the papers. Big, spectacular crashes caused by terrific speed or drunk driving or some other form of what I call near insanity. But most people only squeeze the law a little at stop signs, in restricted speed zones and the like. Little violations that most people get away with time after time. Maybe getting a ticket 
or a warning like Frank Jr. did, but without getting hurt. But those little violations, those little chances you take day by day, that's where you start playing roulette with your life. You're taking a big gamble with your life when you violate a no passing line on the road. You're taking a big chance in the car in front when you follow too closely at highway speeds. Maybe a man will do these things a hundred times in perfect safety. Squeeze the law and nothing happens. But don't forget that other law, the law of averages. Sooner or later, it catches up with you. Now this accident was number one for the driver involved. First one he'd ever had, but it was his last one, too. He took one little chance too many. Frank is taking too many chances in his car. Oh, he'll be all right, won't he, Al? He'll be all right if he takes to heart what I told him about signs. Signs of life. That's what stop signs and all the other road signs really are. And missing one of them as you drive along or just ignoring it. Well, that's one of those little things that kills people. Wherever there's a hazard on the road, there's usually a sign to tell you about it, like a curve warning, or a right-of-way sign, narrow bridge, signals ahead, do not enter, no passing, and many others. But for too many drivers, a stop sign like this, for example, has no importance unless they can see cars crossing the road ahead right now. A school crossing sign, for some drivers, seems to mean little or nothing, unless there are children actually crossing the street at that moment. As for railroad crossings, some drivers act as if the warning signs and tracks don't even exist, unless there's a streamliner passing by right in front of them. And even then, hard as it is to believe, there are many accidents where the driver ran past three warning signs and straight into the side of a moving train. It has happened in broad daylight, but it happens even more often at night. That's when the warning sign, the signal, the crossbuck are really your signs of life. Yes, the sign is still there, but you have to be twice as alert to see it. If you hadn't seen the signs, this train might come as a surprise to you. Traffic signs and signals that are so easy to see in the daylight become easier to miss as the sun goes down. Twilight is a dangerous time of day when things are half visible, half in deepening shadow. Main Street at night becomes a maze of lights and neon signs, all competing with one another to catch your eye. But where's the traffic signal? Oh, there it is, almost lost against the other lights beyond. Even the blinking red light of the railroad wigwag is hard to pick out sometimes. But night or day, these are your signs of life, whose purpose is to keep you alive. It's a strange thing, but some people actually resent traffic signs and traffic laws. How come? Cramps their style. They figure rules are for the other fellow, not for good drivers like themselves. Now here's one like that. Robert Bainbridge. Bainbridge? From Meridian High? Yeah. Oh, I know him. I ran against him on the track team. I knew him. I'm sorry, dear. Robert Bainbridge, age 17. Occupation, student. Place of accident, Lone Tree Road near Meridian. Date, June 2nd. Time, 417. 
Weather, clear and dry. I gave him the light and siren on Highway 41 when he was doing about 70. His first mistake was speeding. His second mistake was when he tried to outrun me. Then he turned off into Lone Tree Road. That was his third mistake. I didn't chase him on that gravel road. I didn't want him to keep up that speed on such a treacherous footing. I just followed along without the flash or a siren, hoping he'd realize what he was doing before it was too late. I lost sight of him around the turn. He took it way too fast for gravel. I rounded the turn, the road ahead was empty. I knew what had happened even before I found the car. Of course, the boy had tried to stop when he felt his car going out of control, but he never had a chance. Understand it. Why did he do it? You tell me. That's one thing the reports don't show. Why people do things with a car that make no sense at all. Well, I guess a young fellow in a car figures he's quick enough to save himself. Quick enough? If a human body could match a machine. When you get to be my age, you slow down. Well, you can remember the old days, can't you, Mr. Dixon? Yep. When a tandem bicycle wasn't just a showpiece for an old-timer's day celebration, but a real, honest-to-goodness means of transportation. Sometimes we forget that there are plenty of people on our highways today who grew up in that horse and buggy age. Those narrow, two-lane country roads that used to be so quiet and peaceful are now several lanes of high-speed traffic. The roads that used to wind gently around the hills now slice through mountains with nothing to slow you down. And many a rail crossing that stopped you in the old days is now a high-speed underpass or overpass. Everything in the world of transportation has improved. Everything except the drivers. We still have to use the same old equipment. Our eyes and ears and reflexes. They haven't improved a bit. No, they haven't. When I was a kid, I run 100 yards in 11 seconds. Yeah, I used to run me down in about three jumps. No, Gaff? 11 flat. That's faster than I ever run it in. Well, point is, Alan, you have to face a much greater danger on the road than your grandfather did with no better equipment. No better personal equipment, that is. Well, the highways and the cars are better and faster, of course. And that's where the danger is. Yes, danger. Even with sensible, safe driving people on a highway as smooth as silk, with no traffic lights and no intersections to worry about. You might wonder, where is the danger we keep talking about? Well, here's one danger, fatigue. On long trips, fatigue is a big hazard. You should stop at least once every hour. Get out, stretch your legs, get those cobwebs out of your head. Weariness slows down your reactions. And at 60 miles an hour or better, you can't afford it. And here is still another danger. Lack of attention to the road. Sure, it's an open highway. Maybe there aren't many cars, but it only takes two to tangle. 
40% of all expressway accidents involve a car that has already stopped. On the road, part way on, or not far enough off. This is an invitation to disaster. Here is another hazard of our superhighways that we patrolmen see all too often. Every time you have to hit your brakes hard, ask yourself, why weren't you ready for the danger that suddenly developed? The parked car that suddenly pulls out without looking is always sudden, of course, and always surprising. A man who decides at the last moment to make a turn. The entering car that fails to yield the right of way. Well, sure, the other fellow's often wrong. And if he causes a crash, it's all his fault. But you may be dead just the same. In a lot of accidents, it's pretty hard to tell just who is to blame, isn't it, Al? Impossible to tell sometimes. But there's one kind of accident where there's never a single doubt. What's that? At a railroad crossing. Yep. The train sure has the right of way. You know, the railroad's been here for almost four generations. Every farm family in these parts uses the railroad to ship their crops. We all like to ride the trains. But why is it so many people don't see the trains at the crossings? It seems impossible that anyone could fail to see or hear a train in motion. A locomotive is certainly big enough, and the train of cars behind it may be as much as a mile long. And yet, many people who have lived through a crossing accident will say, where did the train come from? I never saw it until it was right on top of me. Where did it come from? Well, it came on the rails. It couldn't come from anywhere else. But if you paid no attention to the signs, didn't look, and didn't listen, then to you it came out of nowhere. An approaching train starts the signal while it is still some distance away. Never try to guess how far away. Don't guess at all. And don't be impatient, because the train's coming and it can't stop. signal in action means that a condition of fatal danger exists at this moment at this crossing. Maybe the last train you waited for was a slow freight and took several minutes to cross. But the next one may be a fast freight, eyeballing to the coast on a tight schedule. Remember that many freight trains today are faster than passenger trains of 15 years ago. Many crossings have more than one set of tracks, each one a separate hazard. When you cross, make sure all tracks are clear. Yes, don't let a double track double cross you. Stop, look, and listen, the cross buck says. All right, let's listen. As this train approaches, let's see how close it comes before we hear it. Any train come from? Comes on the rails, of course. And who gets killed at the crossing? Someone who's crossed that same track at the same place a thousand times before, but just one time he didn't look. One time is all it takes. Please speak to Frank about his driving. It worries me. Okay, I will. I'll do it tonight. I surrender, Hal. I give up. What's the charge? No charge, Frank. I'm just giving Alan some free advice now that he's a licensed driver. 
Boy, I remember that advice you gave me the other day at the stop sign. Well, you keep it in mind. I will. Dad, Dad, can I take the car into town now? Okay, Alan, go ahead. But take it easy. Oh, I'll, I'll be real careful. Goodbye. He'll be all right. Oh. Look at the guy go. Hey, maybe we better go along with him, make sure he gets there all right. Okay, buy me soda. Okay, fine. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. So, there went Alan with his new driver's license and Frank and Betty right behind on as nice a summer day as you could wish for. Why don't they look, Ralph? Tell me. Why don't they look? No, I didn't go in. Burying someone like young Frank Dixon is too hard to take. My place was out on the road. Out on the road, I could at least try to keep other people from killing themselves in their cars. So if the next car I stop happens to be yours, don't tell me you were only speeding a little, only breaking the law a little, only doing something a little bit wrong. Save that for somebody else, brother, because I see too many little follies that end up with someone a little bit dead. <laughs> 